Yeah, busy week. People out of school now, graduated college, out of high school now, college now, all this other fun stuff going on. It's uh, it's pretty exciting. It makes me feel old. I see all these people graduating. I'm like, that was like six, seven years ago, but uh, it's fun. Well, hey, let's uh, let's pray and get into it. Father, we just come to you tonight, and uh, we thank you, God. We thank you for the opportunity to come together uh, as family, uh, to talk about you, to talk about your word. Lord, we thank you that we're two or three gathering your name. There you are in the midst. And Father, we thank you for this uh, next period of time that you would just uh, be with us. Holy Spirit, that you would uh, come in the room, speak to people, minister to people uh, exactly what they need. Father, may, may their heart be like wood, may my tongue like fire, and that I would speak exactly what you would want to speak. Father, no more, no less. And we just thank you for tonight in advance. Thank you tonight, God, for answered prayers. Thank you tonight, God, for miracles. Thank you tonight for demonstration of power. Thank you tonight, God, that we leave encouraged. Thank you tonight, God. We just we just stir ourselves. Go ahead, just just start to thank the Lord. Come on, just just start to thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for what He's done for you. Thank the Lord for what He's done today. Just start to thank. Father, we thank you. Thank you for life. Father, thank you for waking us up today, God. Thank you, Lord, for filling us with fresh air in our lungs, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the roofs over our head. Thank you for the clothes on our back, God. Thank you for our family. Thank you for our friends, God. Thank you for the people you've put into our lives that, that can encourage us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for a place like Committed that we could come and be encouraged, Lord, together. Thank you, Father, Lord, for, for this beautiful day that you've given us, God. Lord, in rain or shine, Father, we thank you that our mood, we're not moved by our emotions. We're not moved by our feelings. Lord, I thank you that, that, that we rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you. Then again, your word says rejoice. Father, we thank you. Lord, some, Lord sometimes we just got to push. Sometimes we just got, and he, you guys don't got to worry about him. He's just a running around preacher, does his own thing. Um, that's Aiden. He's an acrobat, you know. But, um, you know, the Bible says that, that, that sometimes we got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. And, and a lot of times uh, the, the, you know, people who talk about praying in tongues, they think that, you know, that, that, that's what it means to encourage yourself in the Lord. But it's way more than that. Obviously, you know, thank God for praying in the Holy Ghost. You know, Jude 120 says, stir yourself up in your most holy of faith, praying out in the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says that we got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Because here's the thing. Uh, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, and I'm not going to talk about anything that, we don't, that most of you have never heard. But we're, I never feel like we can get away from the basics. I think a lot of times we, uh, we rush through a lot of things and we miss, um, we miss a lot. So we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. When you get there, say, uh, I got it. Pixels, paper, whatever you want to use. So we're just going to go ahead and, uh, 2 Corinthians. Oh, look, it helps if I'd be in the right chapter. That's 417 is really good, too. Maybe we'll go to that one later. But we'll go to 517. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, uh, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become brand new. Now all the things uh, are of God who has uh, reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not uh, imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Something that, you know, we hear that quoted over and over again. You know, you've probably heard me say it several times even being here. You know, but if we're in Christ, we're a new creation. And, and, I, and, and I think our understanding of what being born again means is it's just, well, I'm now a child of God. And a lot of times, you know, when we grew up in church, we use so much Christianese. Right, well, man, I'm a child of God, I'm a son of God. Okay, but what does that really mean? Like, what does that practically mean? What does that, what does that, let, let's get out of the, the under, let, let's think back before you ever knew anything about church. Sometimes I think we got to go back there. Because we, 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 we become, knowledge is puffed up. And you can know a lot of words, you can have a knowledge of a lot of things. But the Bible, one thing the Bible says uh, is this, it says in all you're getting, get what? Get understanding. Doesn't say get money, get fame, get relationships, get kids, get jobs, get houses. It says get understanding, and 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 the thing is, is it, my desire is for you not just to hear this, but to get this, 
to understand this. Because the thing is, is when you came in Christ, it wasn't that Jesus just came into your heart and now you said, you know, you, you prayed and only yeah, you're going to go to heaven and, and we get all that. But like when you became in Christ, you, you became completely new. Like, like these things called emotions that run your life, that's not a part of what your original identity was, right? You say, well, Kyle, how does that make any sense? Well, we'll kick over here to Genesis chapter 1. We'll get going here. We'll get you guys all awake. No, I'm kidding. Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 26, 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them uh, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the bird of the airs, over the cattle, over all the things and all the creeping things creeping on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we see here in the very beginning that, that we are made in his image and in his likeness. Well, when Adam, when Adam sinned, right, God, 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 Adam sinned, then we have God sitting here saying, Adam, where are you? And what was Adam's response? You want to know? Here, we'll go to this where we, just, where we can read on the story. Well, I can paraphrase for you, make it easy for you. In other words, Adam didn't say, hey, hey, buddy, uh, I messed up. He immediately blame shifted, said it was the woman's fault. It's not my fault, God, that I did it. It's her fault. How many times, you know, that was the first place in Scripture, in humanity, that, that selfishness entered the world right? No one has to teach my son to want to, to wanna fight over a toy. He has that nature of Adam that's only inside of him, and eventually he's going to need to get born again, and he's going to get to understand that selfishness is a part of who he is, right? Because love doesn't wake up asking, what can you do for it? Love wakes up, says, what can I do for you? Because when I'm in Christ, I'm a new creation. When I'm a new creation, guess what? I got a new mind. I got a new perspective, I got a new, uh, a new way to think about things, a new way to feel about things. And, and the thing is, we can't be moved by what we feel. And, so, and so, many, so much in our culture right now wants to have expression in its feelings and in the church world of things. We can get so easily caught into that. Man, would you have an opinion? Actually, I don't. I really don't. I mean, I could give you what I think, but, but, but what does the word say about the situation? What does the father say about the situation? And, and, and we never can, ah, so many times myself, one of the greatest faults of my own was, was pride. You know, the Lord told me one time, he said, Kyle, you've embraced the cover of a book, but you've never become the message in it. And that was about six years in of being saved. Now, it doesn't mean I wasn't saved, but it was, I was, I was, I was stuck in performance Christianity. I was embracing a form of godliness, right? We can all talk about what he's done. We can all talk about uh, how he can do it, but, but, but can we live it truly? And I think sometimes we get so busy in the rat race. The cool thing is we are all in a rat race, but if you're like, hey, I won, you're still a rat. It's so like, why get in the rat race? Like, we're not trying to keep up with the Joneses. We're, we're, who he, we're a son, we're a daughter, and we got to learn to realize God didn't just say, hey, get saved and move up out of this place. You know, you go into Jeremiah 29, 11, and we always like to quote that scripture, Right? Everyone likes to quote Jeremiah 20 and 11, but they don't want to read the previous 10 verses. It was a promise given to them in the middle of captivity, and the Lord told them, hey, go, go and subdue the land. Go and multiply. Go and have families. Go and have kids. Go and do this. Go and do that. Marry the land. And, I, and that's my challenge to you guys tonight is to remind you, who are you? You're a new creation in Christ, and you're not to be moved by what you feel. You're not to be moved by what you see. You're not to be moved by the opinions of man. You're not to be moved by, by how people view things. And I've had to really begin to start to challenge myself, you know, coming in this year of 12 years being saved and born again. I have to sometimes step back and say, but where am I really at? Like where I think I am and where, I, where I'm at is probably completely two different things. And I got to get honest with myself. I got to get real with myself. I got to start asking myself, who am I surrounding myself with? Who's going to challenge me to actually look into myself and say, hey, where am I at? Right? Uh, you know, when you look at working out, it's always, I mean, a lot of people are, are self-motivated. They can go to the gym. But anything you do with somebody is always better. And when you have somebody who, who, who you can lift with, someone who's going to correct your form, someone that's going to say, hey, I've noticed you've been slacking off a couple of days. What's going on here? Right? I mean, and I, because the ability to be fit 
has always been inside of uh, inside of somebody, right? Example, like I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I used to be, but I'm not where I want to be. And the thing is this, is everything in me is created to become something better. But I have to go position myself and put in the work. But just putting in the action isn't good enough without knowing what I'm doing. And a lot of times we can sit here and we can carry this word around. We can quote all the Christian songs, quote all the Christian music, go to all the Christian events and still be an out of shape Christian. And here we are walking around. We know what to say to make people feel good. We know how to say it to make them respond. We, we know how to sway people. But at the end of the day, the only one I'm fooling is nobody but myself. And God's like, yo, what are you doing? Because, see, he's never lost sight of who you were. That's why in your darkest hour, he's still good. Because love seeks the higher good of another individual. Love sees in someone the finished work that they can't see in themselves. Love says, how can I lay my life down for you today? Love says, God, what are you doing? How can I get involved? But if I don't understand this reality that I'm a completely new born-again Christian, like it's more than just I said a prayer. It's more than just I'm going to church. It's more than just, hey, I'm working on myself. Like there isn't this, oops, I made a mistake. I must still be having sin problems in my life. It doesn't work that way. When you got new, you got new. What the problem was, you never changed the way you think. But if I keep it, how many times do we hear it? Is we, we, and I'm guilty of it. Man, that's something that I, that I used to deal with in my past. That's not who I am anymore. And if I, I'll quit trying to, so many times we try to change behaviors in our lives. We try to change the way we do things. But if I'll start to change the way I think and how I see myself, my behaviors will start to change automatically. Right? When I start to think righteous, when I start to think uh, that, that I'm loved, when I start to believe that I'm loved, when I start to believe that I've been forgiven, when I start to walk in how the Father sees me and what he says about me, all of a sudden your actions start to change. You don't even do anything because one yes can mean a thousand no's. And, and so many times, even, even being saved, we, we, we say no to stuff. Man, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to mess up. Why am I sin conscious? Why am I trying to identify with the person I used to be? Why not get son conscious? Father, I thank you. I'm new in you. Lord, I'm not moved by what I feel and what I see. I don't, I don't, I don't count it uh, 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 separate from me because it's part of this process of being in humanity. But I don't, I'm not moved by my feelings. Like, I, I got to get grounded in this stuff. We got to get grounded in it because, right, I could have, we could come in here tonight and say, man, I really didn't feel nothing. God didn't move. God didn't do anything. It's not about feelings. It's about an understanding when people come into a room with one mind, one accord, the Father's there, right? You're like, man, this is crazy tonight. Yeah, it's fun. We're having a good time. Amen? So the thing is, is who are you? You're, you're, you're a new creation. You're in Christ. We understand that we're made in the image of God. We understand that we're not moved by what we feel and what we see. Uh, but it's a daily, continual choice to walk with him, right? My wife, when, I got, when we got married about four years ago, coming up to four years of marriage, um, yeah, the feelings were great in that moment, but it's the commitment that I made to her that continues to allow us to walk hand in hand as one today because it's not always blue skies, butterflies, lovey-dovey, and rainbows, right? It's right. Okay. My Aiden, the other night, he, he went to bed at nine o'clock. He woke up at 12 AM. He didn't want to go to sleep till two 30, still wouldn't go to bed. So I was riding around in my car at three 30 at night. So he could fall asleep. Got up the next morning. I'm like, screw, I don't want to go to the gym. I woke up I'm like, I need to go. So I went, it was great, whatever. But it's, but I made a, com- I'm his father. There's nothing he can do. Nothing he can say. No, no way he could behave that would ever change me caring for him. But I have to be rooted in understanding my position as his father, the same as me as a son to the Lord. I have to get grounded in these things. Because guess what? Life is only going to get busier for, for some of us. Some of you that's graduated high school, college, your things, your endeavors you want to do. Life is just going to get busy. And I have to come to not forget who I am in this new creation in Christ. When I made that decision in 2010 of March at, 19, at 16 years old, as a freshman in high school, I can't forget I became new in that moment. It wasn't that I'm, I'm now still trying to become new. I, w- I was brand, brand R new. God didn't, God didn't hold anything back, and I didn't hold anything back, right? So by understanding, though, who you are, the thing is now God wants to use you and I to release our faith. As we were in worship, that was something that God really spoke in my heart is, is 
a lot of times we talk about we have faith, but, but we don't know how to let, put our faith into action, right? A lot of times we can have the, 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 the fast car, but we'll never see the potential of it driven until the one in the driver's seat has the experience and the knowledge of how to make it perform the way it was created to, right? And the thing is, is I want to encourage you guys tonight that before you ever can release what is in you, you have to first understand who you are. And obviously, that's a brief of going over that. So we're going to turn over to Mark 11, 23. You guys, this making sense to you guys? Everyone's good? You're like, yeah, Kyle, it's great. Five more minutes so I can get out of here, get some sleep. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I won't take forever. You guys are like, Mark 11, 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the second book in the Mark 11, 23. Right? Verse 22. Uh, it says, so Jesus answered and said to them, have, have faith in God. Another translation says, have the God kind of faith. For surely I say to you, whoever, who's a who, whoever, I'm a whoever, you're a whoever, <clears throat> excuse me, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So I want you to understand tonight that even though we're in Christ and it's not about what we feel, how many times is it when you believe God for things, in the moment it doesn't feel like it may happen, right? Or a lot of times you may not even feel anything. You're just like, uh, it's kind of like, uh, uh, um, you know, it, it's just you don't feel nothing. It's just whatever. Well, it's not about a feeling. It's about an understanding because when you got born again, God's faith was placed on the inside of you. You've been given the God kind of faith. And by having the God kind of faith, the God kind of faith can do what? The God kind of faith, uh, by faith, right, God formed the world. By faith, we can go through Hebrews, and I won't, we won't do that today, but you can go later on and read in the book of Hebrews a whole chapter to, uh, to, to a hall of faith, to people, it was by faith they did this, by faith they did that, by faith they did this. Because faith, faith is an ability to, to do things. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's something that a lot of times we take for granted, and it's just something we say, oh, man, I'm, I, I got faith. But faith, I, it can move mountains. And it's not about what I feel. It's understanding it's God's faith in me wanting to work through me. But I have to understand that by being a son, when I know who I am and his faith is in me, that I don't have to doubt now. Right when I was before I was saved, I, I I used to doubt all the time. Why? Because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. But when you and I got born again, we got the mind of Christ on the inside of us, and the Bible says that now our thoughts can be our His thoughts, and our ways can be His ways. And when I understand His thoughts and I understand His ways, I understand the faith that He's given me. So you don't even got to work for this faith that's going to work for you. It, it, this faith God gives to you when you got born again. He's given you a measure of faith, but it's just like a muscle. If you've never believed God for $5, how are you going to believe him for a million? You got to start somewhere. It's very practical. It's very tangible. When I was, when I graduated high school and I went to Bible college, I'm going to sit down a second. Um, I didn't, uh, um, I didn't have a whole lot. I worked for a few months during the summer and I had about a thousand dollars to my name and I moved to Florida in June, July, no, July of 20. 14, 15. I lived an hour and a half away from school, one direction. I, I had a, uh, my vehicle I was blessed with, whatever, but I was working as a busser. I had $146 car insurance to pay. I had 40 bucks in gas a week, $300 of rent, not including food. And working as a, bu as a busser. I had an IBM laptop for you all that know what that is. Windows 93, uh, Microsoft 93. Uh, I had a sheet blanket, no, no blanket, and I had a pillow. My cabinets were empty. My fridge was empty, but I'm on a mission because God called me to go to Bible school. I didn't call mom. I didn't call dad. I didn't say, hey, I need you to write a check. I need your money. I said, God, if I can't learn to believe you here when the rubber meets the road, because guess what? There's going to come a time in your life, and I'm not saying that we should ask people for things. If we need help, um, hear me out. You ask people, but if God... It, there comes a point in your life where there's not a big enough check someone could write for what you're believing for. How many of y'all got dreams? How many of y'all got desires? Come on, can some, do you know anybody now that could write that check for you in your own life that could pay for all that? You know? 
you know, but, but I didn't have anybody at the time. I still don't now because, come on, if, if uh, I heard a guy say this one time, if your, vision, if your vision for your life doesn't intimidate you, it's probably not from God. Um, so what, what is in you, does it, does it in, and I shouldn't say intimidate in a bad way because it's the right perspective. But, man, you should be like, man, how in the world am I going to get this done? Man, Lord, you, gotta, you better redeem the time like your word says. We got work to do. You know what I'm saying? We got people to see saved, lives to see changed. Come on, so, but God's given you this faith. He gave me this faith, but I didn't know how to walk in it until I was in a position to start to have to learn to do it. And I don't want you to have to wait. To, come on, I would rather learn how to swim before getting thrown in the water and freaking out than get thrown in the water freaking out trying to learn to swim. Now, some of us don't always have that case, but, but it's up to us to make a decision as, as believers that we need to understand these things. We don't need to just say, oh, yeah, I know the scripture. No, do you understand the concept? Are you able to sit and walk somebody through it? And I had to learn this. So as I was learning simple scriptures, this, this is one of, the, one of the foundational scriptures that you should learn, memorize, get in your heart, get in your spirit. Um, I had to learn to say, okay, God, you gave me faith. Father, I thank you that you, you shall supply all my needs. You know, the Bible says that in, in, in Psalms 23, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want or lack. Father, your word says that you've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. Father, your word says that whatsoever things I desire, when I pray, not doubting in my heart, that I can receive it. Come on. But we got to learn to believe that. Like, we just can't be Christians who just, we, a lot of people say stuff. Come on, right? People talk a big talk, but can they really walk the walk? Right, come on, a lot of people's like, oh, man, they're, they're, they're great on a, on, a, on a video game. But you're like, bro, have you ever, have you ever played basketball in your real life? <laughs> right, they get out there, you're like, oh, shoot, this is the, this is the real deal, right? It ain't going to happen. Me, I suck. I'm not great at basketball. But the thing is, is, is I had to make a decision to grow up in some of these things. So as I was in Bible school, I would wake up, and, and I'm just being practical with you guys tonight, you know, because there's things in our lives we could be believing God for right now, things that we all should be believing the Lord for, stretching our faith for. If you don't, I challenge you, make a list. Take three things that you say, God, I'm gonna, I want to believe you for something. And for me at this time, it was uh, simply, uh, I started out because I didn't understand in Matthew 6.33, right? It says, seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Up before that, he talks about not worrying. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, right? Uh you know, look at the fish. I mean, look at the birds, how they're taken care of, right? If God will take care of the bird, how much for you? You're his son, right? There's nothing that my son could ever do that would keep me ready to provide for him. He actually has resources waiting for him. He just doesn't even know it because he doesn't have the ability and maturity to handle it or even know how to ask for it. See, a lot of us have things that God's wanting to give to you and give access to you, but you don't know what you have because you don't know what the word says about you and what's been made available to you, right? So, to God, he's unlimited. He has unlimited resources for you and I to tap into. So as I began to stand on God's word, um, all of a sudden, I got up every day, and I started making my bed. And every day I would say, with, right, the Bible says, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to the Lord. I always thought that was a funny scripture. Like, here I am asking God for things, but yet now here I'm thanking you. See, the thing is, is the only reason why we're able to thank God is because we we've, we've, we've let go of trying to make that thing happen. Right, it's always after I do something, it's thank you for your help. It's after I did something or after he did something because it's already been handed off. See, and the thing is, is you and I got to learn to just hand, hand things off to God. We have to get to a place to say, God, I'm not going to try to do this in my own ability, my own strength, and my own might. God, I'm going to, by faith, Father, I give you this situation. Lord, I thank you that you're providing me, not just with my needs. And that's maybe where some of you are tonight. Maybe you, that's... Maybe it's where you're starting at. You got needs and you've not, that's where you're at. There's no shame. Maybe some of you have moved past to knowing how to believe God for your needs, but now you're learning to believe God for your wants, for your desires, even for the things he's put on the inside of you. So we're all in, a, in the same boat here. He's given us all the same measure of faith, but it's what are you choosing to work, right? We all have the choice. If I want to get better, I got to put in the action to grow. So as I begin to put in the action, all of a sudden my mom calls. Hey, you need anything? I said, no, I'm good. She's like, all right, well, I'm sending you something in the mail. And I'm like, what's that? She's like, well, it'll get there. Uh, a week later, guess what? It was a brand new comforter. She didn't know I didn't have a blanket for, for two months or however long it was. If she would have known I wouldn't have had one, she would have beat me because she would have told me, why didn't you ask me? But I wanted to learn, God, I want to be able to trust you. 
you know, and, and as time goes on, obviously God blessed me with food baskets, started showing up, had gift cards come randomly in the mail for the gas station right outside of where my school was. Um, you know, I got later on, I was in a wreck one street from my house on the way home. I got blessed to stay close to the church, got hired on staff. The rest goes on and on. I could, you know, go on with my wife and I. Uh, we drive a vehicle that we never paid for. Somebody, we were in a wreck. It was totaled before we came back to West Virginia. She's like, how are we going to get to, um, how, how am I going to get to work? I'm like, God's going to figure it out. I'm out here digging fence posts, putting fence in the ground. And her grandma shows up at her work. Doesn't know anything about it. Says, hey, I've been car shopping for you. That next day that she went and wrote a $20,000 check and bought us a brand new vehicle. Right? God knows what we need when we need it. See, the thing is, when we begin to start, and I'm not saying that, say, hey, look at me. Like, my wife and I, our whole wedding was paid for. Our honeymoon was paid for. Of the place we moved into, we've never had to furnish a home. God's furnished our entire home, our entire apartment. Like, we've never, I've never had to buy a vehicle ever. You know? But that started because I sowed a seed when I was 17 years old to a guy and his wife, whose truck broke down, he saw the one someone gave to me just sitting, and I wasn't ever going to do anything with it, and I gave it to him. And I really believe that from that day, and when was it, 2011, 20, 2011, 2012, since then, we've never, never lacked with a vehicle. So I'm not saying, hey, look at Kyle, I just want to encourage you guys, this thing's real, it works, if you work it. And you say, well, Kyle, I've been standing on something for a week, well, you keep standing. And you've done all the stand you stand there for. But I don't have to beg God. See, that's a, that's a lot of things is when we know who we are, we don't have to beg God. God, it, Lord, I, Lord, you got to make this happen. And if you don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. No, Father, I thank you. See, because there's a difference between you hear people pray who know who they are and people who pray that don't know who they are. Because you can be born again and not know who you are and what's, what, what, what's available to you. Right, So a lot of times, we, and we've all been there. There's no shame. Ain't no shame in the game of praying. But I've been there. Father, I don't, I, Lord, God, I need you to help me. Lord, I don't know how to do this. God, I, I'm just trusting you to, to help me figure this thing out. Or Father, bring this in. Lord, if it's your will. right? You hear people pray that. God, if it's your will, let this be done. And it's not that their heart is wrong. It's just a lack of understanding. But when you understand, like we talked about earlier, that you're a child of God, that everything that's his is yours, you have access to it now through Christ. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that according to your word, you shall supply all my needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you that you are bringing in everything that I need. Come on, because there comes, with identity comes authority, comes understanding, comes application, how to practically apply the things of the word. Um, and the list goes on. Obviously, we can ramble on about a lot of things, but I wanna encourage you guys to let loose your faith. It's in you to do this. God put the desire in you. God has you living in this time, such a time as this for now. You, were, you could have been born in any other time, but you're born in this time. Why? You're made of the right stuff. You're born for this time. And it's, but, but I wanna challenge you, start using your faith. Think back when you were first saved. Think back when you were first saved. How simple was walking with God then? And have you made it more complicated than, than it was then now? Right? Because sometimes we got to learn as Christians, as we grow in knowledge, we can sometimes lose that childlikeness because we become self-dependent on the knowledge that we've gained that we feel like we don't have to rely on God anymore. And it's pride and it's selfishness. But that becomes... But when we see these things, all of a sudden, God, I'm sorry, man, I was in the way here. Let me step back. Father, you're the source. Because a lot of times, we'll, we're, we're, God, I'm believing you for something, but I'm over here trying to make it happen in my own ability. But there has to be a healthy balance. God says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it unto the Lord. So, yeah, it's important for you to know how to work and have a job and pay bills and take care of things. But it's not in my it's not me that got me my house, my money. My, it's God who put the breath in my lungs, the ability to live, the ability to breathe, the ability to work, to be able to do what I do. So all me, it's him that's be, helping me be able to do it all along. It's nothing that I did. So I want to encourage us tonight is, is start to use your faith. Come back to being a child again. Start to dream again. Start to, start to think with no limits. What would you do if time and money wasn't a factor? God's put it in you to see these things come to pass. And sometimes these things are short-term. Sometimes these things are long-term, right? I, I, there's a lot that I thought I wanted to do, and I didn't realize how much further down the road it probably was going to be. 
But in God's mind, one day the Lord is like a thousand years. So to you and I, it's really just a glimpse if you want to think about it. So I got to learn to, to think bigger, believe bigger, ask bigger, whatever you desire. You know, the crazy thing is it's him that put the desire in you. But here's the beauty of free will. God loves you so much that he wants to work with you. And it takes your yes to him to get involved. So he put the desire in you and you got born again. You come to understand your, who you are in Christ. And now you can work alongside of him and get in the game off the sidelines and start doing some stuff. But so many times we, we get satisfied with just having the uniform on. I'm on the team of God, but I'm not on the court playing in life. I made the team. I'm going to heaven. I go to church. I, I have great attendance. And I'm missing out on that, man, I could be in the game. And so many times we can talk ourselves into being satisfied with just sitting on the team. But man, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, yeah, it's great when the team wins the game, but there's something about when you were in the moment that let the game win, right? There was something about when I would wrestle and I was in my, I was, it, was, I was, it was a double elimination. It was senior year. I was in regionals. I couldn't lose this match or I was done, but I won. And I was able to, my team was able to go to states, but I was able to go because I was a part of that. And God wants to use you to get in the game and win. The only way God's, God's plan, God's mission, God's will can come to pass on the earth through your life is through your yes to him. It's no other way. He won't push himself on you. He won't force himself on you. He won't try to make this thing happen. He wants to use you in the faith that he's placed inside of you. Amen? I don't have my phone on me. What time is it? Is that clock? Seven. All right. I'm about to wrap up, amen? One last thing here, then I'll leave you guys alone. You guys all right? Is this good? Does it make sense? All right, I'm just, I'm just excited. I got so many things going on in my brain. Um, cool, let's go to John 4, then we'll wrap up. A few thoughts here. Mm-hmm. I think it's John 4. I'll let you know when I flip there because I always pass it. Yeah, John 4, I think. Um, found the scriptures I'm looking for here. All right. Now we're going to back up. There we go, on my page anyways. So we're going to read some scripture here for a little bit, and then we'll um, we'll get ready to close out. So this is a common set of scripture that we've all read, but uh, something that I want to bring out here. Uh, in John chapter 4, um, let's go down to uh, verse 10. It says, And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and whom is, is he who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. To this woman, this woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And this well is deep. Excuse me. Where then do you get your living water? And you get. And are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave you this well, and drank from it himself as his sons and his livestock? Verse thirteen. Then Jesus answered, said to him, Whoever drinks of this water will not thirst again, but whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give to him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Something just to encourage you guys with. Obviously, there's a lot we could say, but you and I were born again. We got a fountain on the inside of us. We got a river of living water. We got a fountain of life. We got a well of life. And here's the thing I want to ask you. Um, how many of y'all that know, know people who are saved, but they talk negative? They say things they shouldn't say. They do things they shouldn't do. How can bitter water kind of come out of what's so supposed to be a pure well? If you got bitter things coming out of your mouth, you need to ask yourself, what's going on with your well? Right? Because the Bible says, do all things without complaining and disputing, for it's God who gives you both the will and the desire to do about what he's called and created you and I to do. Right? It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me, the hope of glory. And the life that I now live, I live hidden in Christ in God. Right? So it's no longer what can, I, what can you do for me, it's what can I do for you. What, I'm waking up, I'm, I'm putting my Kylo on, keep my love on, right? Uh, I gotta put on love today. 
I got to get up in the morning. God, I think I'm not living for me. I'm living for you. Who can I talk to? Who can I reach to? Who can I speak to today? Who, what, what people are looking and thirsty all around you and you happen to be the, the source of life that they're looking to drink from, right? When people say you shouldn't associate, Jesus shouldn't have been associated with this woman based on a tradition. Jesus could have went another way, but he chose to go this direction. He wasn't stupid. He was just doing what the Father wanted him to do. But I want to encourage you, who's drinking from your well? And who are you, who are you providing a well of life to? We all have thirsty people around us. But what are we doing with this? What are we doing with our well? How's the well? You're the maintenance man of your own life. My pastor often says this. You're the maintenance man of your own life. Quit depending on your pastor, your mentors, your leaders, your friends to hold you accountable. Hold yourself accountable. Let the word of God read you. Like James says, it's like a mirror. But don't be like a man who reads, reads this book, looks into a mirror and walks away and forgets what he looks like. That's what religion is. I want to be someone, when I look in this book, I, I say, God, I thank you. I'm going to, come on, this, this, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. His word is who he is, and this is who I am. So when I read this book, Father, I thank you. I'm going to read something about me again today. I'm going to discover something about me I never saw before today when I get in this book. But we're going to keep reading. So we're going to skip over to some scriptures, and we're going to go to uh, verse 27. And it says, and at this point, so obviously for you all that do or don't know the story, obviously Jesus is like, hey, go and tell your husband. She's like, how do you know? You have five. So obviously she's like, oh, my goodness, how does this man know this? Now he goes back, she goes back into town to tell the people, yo, you got to come here with this man's sand. Here we are, verse 27. And at this point his disciples came and marveled that he talked to a woman, yet no one said, uh, what do you seek or why are you talking to her? Isn't it funny that there's people in your life that a lot of times say, why are you talking to that person? Who do you think you are talking to them? I can't believe you're, but don't worry about them people. Because sometimes then they, the disciples were just immature. They didn't know who they were. They didn't understand some things. But that's not the point. Here's the point. It's going to be good here. And it says, uh, verse 28, then the woman The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? See, when you have an encounter with God and you meet him, the things you used to draw life with, you can no longer use anymore because it's insufficient. And the thing is, is that I want to challenge you tonight. Are you still carrying around your old water pots? Are you carrying around the thing that you used to cling to to make you feel approved, to make you feel loved, to make you feel accepted? Are you still saying the things that you used to say to make you feel approved, to make you feel loved, to make you feel accepted? Are you still hanging around the people who, 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 who I mean, whatever this water pot is to you that you used to draw from? People say, well, it could be old temptations. It could be old decisions of things that you used to be addicted to or used to struggle with or or whatever the case is, have you left your water pot? Actually not left it, it says she what? She dropped it. It said that she, yeah, she left it, yeah, left her water pot. I think another translation says she dropped her water pot, comma. You can never go truly tell people of what you've encountered until you let go of the thing that you used to draw from that you called life. Come on, you, we, read, we read over this stuff, but, but, but we don't really take time to sit and think about it. It says, it said, the woman then left her water pot, comma, went her way into the city, comma, and said to the men, comma. Commas are important. Come on, because if she would have, because, well, I mean, there's so much we could say, but, but the thing is, is, is when you truly have an encounter with God, you'll have no desire to want to draw with your own abilities anymore. When you truly taste and see that he's good, There's nothing that, and guess what? I'll be the first one to tell you, I went back to some of the old things even after I was saved. Does that mean I didn't encounter God? No, I lacked an understanding of what that encounter was. But once I've gained this understanding of what it means to be a new creation, that old things have passed away, all things have become brand new, that in Him, and uh, uh, it says, uh, uh, in Him are all things, and at, at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. In him is everything I've ever needed, longed for, desired. 
right? I can't get mad at Aiden because he does something that he doesn't know isn't wrong. Uh, can't get mad at Aiden for doing something he doesn't know is wrong when he doesn't know it's wrong because that's all he knows. But the thing is, is a lot of times, you know, once we get a knowledge, we have to start holding ourselves accountable, right? I look across the room and most of the people here have been saved for a while. Are you still doing things with the water pot you used to run around with before you were saved? And if so, let go of your water pot. Come on, remember that time you drank from him. Remember that time when, 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 when you encountered him for the first time. I mean, come on, this could be you and me. We're sitting here at that moment, at that service, at that house, at that time you and I called on his name and said, God, and he's like, yo, you're not going to have to thirst no more. Man, do you remember that moment? Man, I remember like it was yesterday. I still live in that moment. Come on, I feel like I got saved again every day. I just get up and I'm like, I'm in that moment. Not living in that moment of like the same mindsets and same behaviors, but I live in that reality that I'm new and I'm in him and he's in me and I'm waking up to change the world today. I'm waking up with purpose. I'm waking, come on, Christ in me, the hope of glory, be strong. The Bible says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. God made you alive, active for a purpose. Come on, so he's in you. It doesn't matter anymore about what I feel or think because once I drink from him, there's nothing that even when I tried to go back to it, it wasn't even desirable. I'm like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Why am I saying these things? Why am I looking for what people have? Come on, we hold people's opinions about us higher than what the Father has about us so many times. We're so concerned about what people think and what people have to say. You know why? Because we're still selfish. And you really want to look down to it. It's really idolatry because I'm holding what they are and who they are have to say about me higher than what the Father has said about me. Come on, I could give two rips about what anybody has to think about me. Now, we all in life want to feel loved and accepted, and that's okay. That's part of, that's life. It's humanity. But the thing is, I don't need your approval. Right? If I live for your approval, I'll die by your rejection. I don't need your approval. I, well, I got approved when I got born again. I got, I got stamped. Come on, I, I got the seal of promise, the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. Come on, that, that, that he shed his love abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. Come on, that, that I don't need you to make me feel loved. I got, every, I got what you need. What are you talking about? That's the thing about the world. They don't realize you are what they need. People around you, you are the answer for them. You are that source of life for them. I want to encourage you tonight. Come on, this is what we're here for. It's what it's about. Come on, we, some, we got to dig into things, and we got to understand that, man, this life we live is not about us anymore. When you make your life all about him, he makes life all about you. Come on, when you understand how loved you are by him, you'll just want to go give it away to people freely. They're like, come on, man, I, you said, man, like, I'll just, I hate, I'll just be on a soapbox. Like, I, I am not against uh, the things that God gives science and medical science and all these different things. Of three, there's, there's ways God uses and works in that. But how can I encounter the king of the universe and, and, and what he's done for me and go and, and settle for what someone else has to say? Well, you're just going to be stuck on this medication or you're going to be stuck doing the same thing that you're never going to be able. Like, where's the point that his word is his word or it's not? Like, it may be a temporary thing, but I'm not staying here, right? I believe we people go through things. You know, right now, yeah, I am, I, I'm struggling with depression. But I thank you, Father, your word says that, 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 that I can have the mind of Christ. And I think that I don't have to live depressed. Right now, I'm, I may feel depressed, but I'm new in him. And this doesn't have power over my life. Right, but we got to understand this stuff, guys. We, we got to be able to sit, because guess what? We have a world that is looking more now than ever to, to, to believers. The number one cause of atheism is Christianity. What, Kyle? Yeah. It's people who confess him with his mouth but deny him in their lifestyle. Come on, people could care two rips about uh, 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 how well you can say it, but what do you live in? What are people drinking when they meet you? Are you the first one to say, bro, you better not be cussing around me. Why are you dressed like that for? Well, you get to know them, you can talk like that. But even then, well, come on, your life, if people can live in sin comfortably around you, I'd start asking myself, what am I carrying around? 
doesn't mean that we condemn the people who walk in sin. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they're doing. But I guarantee you, I can remember when I was not saved and I got, was around people who really loved the Lord. And, and it challenged me to say, man, I want what they got. I don't know what it is, but I want what they got. Does this make sense to you guys tonight? So I just want to encourage you, encourage you. All right. We're about to wrap up. Jared, you want to come play on your little uh, acoustic, acoustic guitar? Your little, uh, little str- strummer, not drummer boy, strummer boy. Strummer. He's a strummer. Um, so as we look down here, and we'll, uh, we're about to wrap up, um, I wanna, want you to go do your homework. I want you to go to read John chapter 5. And uh, we're not going to stay in this forever, but I want to pull out a few key points here. Um, obviously, that this is a man at the pool of Bethesda, and, and at the pool of Bethesda, um, people would come. In verse 3, it says, uh, in these, uh, in, uh, we'll, just, we'll just read, right not? You guys are good. You got a few more minutes you can give me? Come on, right? We're not in a hurry tonight. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now they are in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, where in the Hebrew Bethesda have five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. There's some points I want to pull out here before we get down to verse 5. A lot of times that sounds like the church. A lot of people in the world are just waiting. Waiting for a certain place at a certain time. For God to move. And here you have this man who we read in verse 5. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. 38 years. This man, we, as we read in verse 6, when Jesus saw him laying there, knew that he had already been there in the condition for a long time. And he said to him, do you want to be made well? Verse 7. And the, and the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water stirred. But while I am coming, another steps in down before me. See, the thing is this. is Religion is always waiting from a time to time move of God. People's a time to time, well, maybe if it's God's will, he'll move. No, he... He's here and he's ready to move now. And the thing is, is that this certain man, I wrote this down in my Bible, in the presence of an unlimited God, people stay stuck because of explanation. Jesus asked this man one question, and it was this, do you want to be made well? And the man, not realizing who he's talking to, tries to explain to him why he can't be made well and sometimes our explanations keep us from being able to have the breakthrough that's standing right in front of us we're missing it because we're trying to explain why the condition we're in where no one's able to help us and the answer is standing right in front of us saying do you want to be made well do you want to get out of the situation do you want to see your finances turn around do you want to see your family change do you want to see this sin cycle change in your life but God, this is why. But God, this is why. But if you only knew, right? How many times we tell people, man, but if you only understood, you don't hear what you're saying. You're being selfish, trying to make an excuse of why you can't change what you can't change. And the answer is sitting here looking at you saying, do you want to be made well? But the good news is, Jesus is good, verse 8. But Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well took up his bed and walked and he lay and, and he did that was the day on the Sabbath and the Jews therefore said to him uh, he was cured it was the Sabbath it was uh, not lawful for you to carry your bed I love Jesus he, he always likes to disrupt the system right I, 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 I think part Jesus was a savage he was awesome he didn't try to fit in he just did his thing and two reasons why he told him to take his bed to walk was one, uh, I think personally, uh, he knew he hates religious systems. 
so uh, he had him do it. And then two, the thing is, a bed that he was laying on, somebody else was going to need for them to be able to get carried on. Or his bed of him that he used to lay on was a testimony to another person laying in the condition to say, you don't got to stay there. Your testimony is important that you have. You say, man, I don't have a radical testimony of, man, right? So many times I hate that. People like to compare testimonies, right? You have people who grew up in church on one side who may have never, never known sin, never, never was exposed to stuff, had a great home life, great family. I mean, they just grew up in a great home. Maybe the worst thing they did was maybe, you know, I don't know, just say a bad word or whatever they would think would be bad. But then over here you have some radical person in right field or whatever you want to think is a crazy testimony. And then you and then they sit there and go, man, my, my testimony is not powerful. Are you kidding me? It is. Thank God you had a family that loved you and cared about you and raised you up and, and, and God kept you and protected you and watched over you. Come on, don't belittle your testimony. And the thing is, later on in this story, I think if you read down in the scripture, um, or maybe not somewhere, maybe in another, another. Uh, oh, no, no, I think it is. Yeah, so we'll skip down a few verses, and it says, take your head and walk, verse 13. But then the one who was healed did not know who he was, for Jesus withdrew and a multitude being in that place. So the, here's the thing, is that so many people so consumed on how they wanted to get healed that they missed the one who could have healed them all in a moment. And I want to encourage you, and this is the thing that came in my heart out of everything. If you don't get anything, I want you to get this. Don't ever be so consumed with how you think God's going to do it, that you miss it when he's in the room. That you miss it when tomorrow morning when he's trying to speak to you. You're like, oh no, it's not him. No, it's him. Just because it may not show up through the song or through the speaker or through the person or through the way you want, don't think that it's not him. Don't try to sit and explain to him why he can't do what he wants to do. You're right, he can't do it because he won't go against your will. But will you be willing enough tonight to say, God, yeah, just do it. Lord, I'm going to rise up and walk. I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm not going to try to explain it. Come on, we get so caught up in explanation. Quit being, we don't got to be worried. God, let's just do this thing. I want to drop my water pot. So, um, you know, if, if uh, you know, between you and Lord, let's just close our eyes. And, you know, I'm not going to give no call or anything like that. But, um, man, you know if you've been still carrying around your old water pot. And tonight, I just want you tonight to... to if you've not laid down, and maybe some of us all got a water pot in the room of some sort, whether it's something that you're doing or have always done or whatever that you're doing to try to fulfill your own desires, sometimes we got to take a step of faith in the natural. Sometimes we got to do things in the natural to things to move in the supernatural. And tonight, if you've been carrying around a water pot and you say, you know, Kyle, I'm done trying to temp use this old way, old thing. It can be mindsets. It can be confessions. It can be whatever. But I want you to take a step of faith tonight and just come lay it down here at the altar and just go back to your seat. But whenever you can come to that thing, if you're somebody who is a Kyle, man, I, I've had a water pot, but I'm ready, to, I'm ready to leave my water pot so I can go tell the testimony of what my father's done for me. Come on, I'll be the first one to say, I'm going to set down a water pot tonight. I don't know what your water pot is, but you do. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we probably have one. Maybe we have 10. I don't know. Maybe you got a 20-gallon bucket or a tank. But I just want you to take a step tonight and just lay your water pot down. And then uh, just worship the Lord and move on. So, hallelujah.